guys, today in this tutorial, I am going to be teaching you how to make this geometric ring. And what I've got here is a mesh middle, I guess, that's an anaclastic shape, which means that it's kind of tapered into the middle. And then also there's a couple rings that are here on the top and bottom. We'll be using ZBrush to do this, and I'll be teaching you about some things like a curve brush and how to create using some sort of a, a core. Let's take a look at ZBrush real quick. Now, this is the ring as it is in ZBrush. You could see earlier I switched over to a program called KeyShot, which is where we can add photorealistic textures to it and lighting. We'll be doing that at the end of this one, which is something I haven't shown in a tutorial before. So I have ZBrush launched here. Let me show you what that core looks like, just so you can see it. We'll start out by using a cylinder and then using it to create this symmetrical core that tapers in in the middle. Then we'll be using something called a curve brush, and the curve brush will make tubes on this that we can then put together to make the mesh and also the rings on the top and bottom. So if I turn this off, you can see we end up with this ring. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Since I've already been working in ZBrush, I just need to start a new project. So imagine I've been working, I've got some other things open. What I'm looking for is a Cylinder 3D. I don't want one that says Cylinder 3D underscore one. I need the, the real one that says Cylinder 3D, or I can click on the simple brush. It will ask me if I want to switch, and I'll tell it yes, and then do Command N or Control N to get a new document. Now I can go back over here and select either the Cylinder 3D or the Simple Brush. Let's grab the Cylinder 3D real quick, click and drag, and immediately press the T key. That's how we get started working on a new object. Once I press the T key, I'll get this little white line around the stage. If you have my custom interface installed, which I highly, highly recommend, you will have an open area down here at the bottom. That tells me that I've placed an object on the screen, but I have not yet turned it into something called a Polymesh 3D. Let's take a look at the underlying mesh. To do that, on the right-hand side, you'll find a little grid marked Poly F. When you turn that on, and then you can zoom in, you'll see that there are little lines here that show that this is not a series of long vertical polygons, but instead a series of almost squared polygons. That will work just fine for what we're doing. We want a nice coarse mesh for this because we want it to be smooth. Seems a little counterintuitive, but it'll make sense here in a moment. Because this looks good, I can now click Make Poly Mesh 3D, and we're ready to go. Now something happened when I did that. Notice that the uh, cylinder in the middle turned a color, and it still has the lines that we were viewing before. At the moment that we convert this to a Poly Mesh 3D, we also assign it to something called a polygroup, which is indicated by the color. Sometimes in the beginning, I'd get confused because I couldn't understand why this was a color. It has to do with the polyframe over here and the fact that the fill is turned on. So you can see I can toggle that on and off. If I want to turn off the lines and the fill, I can just turn off a polyframe button here. Let's take a look at, um, let's see, the shape is what we need to address next. Well, we need to figure out what axis is up and down on this. It's easier if you turn on the floor. So I'll click on this floor button over here on the right hand side, and I can see that there is a green grid. I also want to double check and make sure perspective is turned off. So just make sure this button is turned off. That looks pretty good. Well, I can tell by looking at this grid where the Y axis is here. Coming up from the green grid would be an arrow that goes straight up and down, and that is a green arrow, which is the Y axis. The way I can tell that is by switching to the move mode. When I switch to the move mode, you can see there's that green axis coming directly out. When I hover over it, it shows me down below its move Y, which is on that Y axis. So just make a mental note of that, and we'll go back over here to the draw mode. Another thing that will become important here is I need to click and drag and press the shift key to snap onto a side view. If I wanted to see the top, I could click and drag and press shift, click and drag and press shift. In a lot of CAD programs, you have to have a key combination to look at a side or a top or whatever. 
In ZBrush, it's simply clicking and dragging and then pressing that Shift key. Let's take a look at the grid again. Let's turn on the polyframe and let's turn the fill off because we don't necessarily need the fill right now. We want to see what we're doing. Because we now know that the up and down axis is the Y axis, we can turn on symmetry. Go to the Transform menu, activate Symmetry, and we're going to turn off Symmetry on the X axis and turn it back on the Y axis. As we hover over this, it's a little bit hard to see, but there is a red dot on the top and bottom. So as I move closer, you can see those dots move closer to each other. As we go in and mask the top of this, or the middle, it will be symmetrical top to bottom. Speaking of that, we're going to use a mask. Now, the reason that we wanted a really coarse grid on this is because when we mask it, we're going to fade this out. And this will make more sense in a sec. Hold down Command or Control, start out to the left-hand side. Make sure that you have Mask Pen chosen up here at the top, and I'm still holding that key. And I'm going to click and drag and make a band around the middle of this. What you'll see is that it's very dark here in the middle, and then it gets lighter, and then there's no mask. Let's clear the mask real quick. Hold down Command or Control, click and drag on the background, and it goes away. This time, let's mask off the top and bottom. Hold down Command or Control, click and drag to enclose maybe about three or four, let's say four of those rows. Now we can see that this is masked off, and then this one's slightly masked, but there's no mask in the middle. We're going to blend this mask, and to do that, hold down Command or Control, and then click once on the cylinder. And you can see that it faded, so we now have a gradation of that. Let's try again. So Command or Control and click one more time, and there you can see that it is fading out, so it's a little bit more masked here, and then there's no mask in the middle. This will allow us to shrink the middle of it and make it that shape, that anti-clastic shape. With my interface selected, or, or in, I guess, loaded into ZBrush, down at the bottom I have an inflate slider. Click and drag that slider to the negative, and you can see that it starts to taper. And I'm going all the way over to the left. If you don't have my interface, that's over here in the deformation section, buried down at the bottom under inflate. Not inflate balloon, but inflate. So it's nice to have it over here where we can use it. Now I want to smooth this. And the easiest way to do that is to use this polish crisp edges here. And there's a little white dot that if we click it, and then maybe polish one or two, you'll see that it starts to smooth it out a bit. We can deflate a little bit more, so I'm just going to the left, and then smooth a little bit more. And it's giving me a basic shape. I don't need too much of a taper, just something like that. Last but not least, I need to release the mask, and I do that by holding Command or Control, clicking and dragging, and there we have our shape. If I turn off the polyframe over here on the right, you'll see that it's very faceted. So we have the right general shape, it's just not very smooth. The way that we can fix that is a process that I use whenever I'm sculpting in ZBrush. If I ever see faceting, I want to get rid of it, I will divide and then delete lower subdivisions. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see the geometry section. There is a button marked Divide. If you hover over it, it will show you the shortcut is Control D, or if you're on a Mac, that's Command D. I'm going to divide and see what the effect is, and then divide again and see the effect. And I'm also looking at the number of active points at the top. If I divide once, you can see that that quadrupled, actually. Let's see what happened under the hood. I'll click on the polyframe button right here and zoom in. Everywhere that I had a polygon, it divided it into four additional polygons, hence the reason that our active point count quadrupled. Let me turn off the polyframe again, and let's divide one more time. And you'll see that it got smoother. Let's turn the polyframe back on, and you can see again, for each polygon, it divided into four and then an additional four. Again, our shape also quadrupled in size.
Let's turn off the polyframe one more time, and I can see there's still a little bit of, a, I guess, a pixelization. So I'm going to divide one more time, and that looks pretty smooth. In general, whenever I'm doing this, when I get to about 32,000 points, it's usually smooth enough. Now, I don't need those lower subdivisions. Let's turn on polyframe one last time, and you can see what's been happening. It divides it into four, into four, into four, and to four again. We don't need all of those extra lower subdivisions. So watch what happens when we click Delete Lower up here. Now we have no subdivisions except for the current subdivision. Let's turn that off, um, turn off the polyframe. And so you can see it's fairly smooth. That is how we create the core that we will now be building on top of. Let's take a look at the type of brush that we're going to use. Now your default up here was probably something like Clay Buildup or the standard brush. Let's switch by clicking on the brush picker over here and look way down in here and look for something that says Curve Tube. We don't want Curve Tube though. We want Curve Tube Snap. Click on Curve Tube Snap. It's the one to the right of that one. And let's talk about curve brushes. A curve brush is one that uses a curve obviously within ZBrush. And as I click and drag across the surface, you can see that it makes a little tube that snaps to the surface, hence the name Curve Tube. It looks pretty good. It's gonna be what we're going to use, but I'll show you something that's kind of interesting. Whenever you have a curve brush, you can see it draws this curve right here. If I click at the end and drag, you can see that I can move it. If I were to click and push up or pull down, you can see that I can move this tube. It's not necessarily sticking to the surface well, but I can modify this tube whenever I use it. Another thing to take into consideration is whenever I drew a curved tube, the core that we created was immediately masked, and then this tube is unmasked. That is going to allow us later to separate the two using something called split unmasked points. Lots of information. I'll give you another quick uh, tip here too. If I move my cursor over to the side where it's red, press the S key as in SAM, I can increase the size maybe to let's say 40, 45. Hover over this line and click, and you can see that I can make it thicker. If I move my cursor out here and press S and take this down to something like 22, 23, click again, you can see I can change the size. If I wanted to stop drawing this curve brush and I don't want to make any more changes, I just click somewhere on the background and then that curve line goes away. And last but not least, to separate this from that core, I can use split unmasked points, which is down here. Or up here in the subtool area, you can look for split and split unmasked or mass points is down here. I put the button for split unmasked points in my interface because I use it so much. When that happens, you can now see that there is the core and then there is the pair of lines that I just created and they're now separate into two separate subtools. Well, I don't need those, so let's click on the lines and let's use the delete button down below to get rid of them and click OK. There we go. So now you have a good basic understanding of a curve tube brush. Let's try another trick though. Let's turn off symmetry. So I'm going to go up here to transform and deactivate symmetry. Move your cursor away from that menu and then click and drag and then press the shift key until you go all the way around this part. And as you let go, you'll see that it put a tube all the way around. Let's just undo. Let's go ahead now that we know that we can do this. Let's try again in the middle. And then you can see I can move this around. Again, it creates this loop. This is the basis of the mesh that we're about to make. I'll undo. This time, let's turn on symmetry again. Let's go back to the transform menu and activate symmetry. It's still on the Y axis, but this time we want to use radial symmetry and give it a radial count of, let's say, 10. 
So type 10 and press return. Then as I click and drag, I'm going to start somewhere in the middle, click and drag and press the shift key, you can see very lightly that there is a mesh that's being created on my ring. And if I start it in the middle, this will be pretty nicely centered. So as soon as you get a design you like, you can just release and there's your mesh. It looks something like that. Now this is a very gentle anticlastic shape. I found that when I was actually fabricating rings, if I made that too, uh, I guess too curved, it was a very uncomfortable ring to, to make. So I would say keep this as a very gentle curve. Again, you'll notice that there's that line that we talked about. In fact, you could even click and drag some of these lines, but for this one, let's just undo and leave it as is. To stop drawing the curve, click anywhere on the core. Notice that the core is masked. Then we can go down to the bottom and choose split unmasked points or use that option over here in the subtool palette. Click split unmasked points and there we have the ring. I can turn the visibility off on this one, so I select the mesh ring and turn visibility off on the core. And there we're left with our ring. Now we just need to go in and add a couple rings on the top and the bottom. So we'll be using something called the append function. You can also use insert, but I always use append. Click on append and look for the ring 3D. Choose that and a very large ring will come here in the middle, which also gave me an idea that this might make an interesting fidget or spinner ring if this was thick enough. I'll switch over here to the ring, and this time I want to move it up. So in order to move it, I need to switch to the move mode. Now I can click and drag this green arrow, which is going to make sure that these are lined up in the center. Because I'm using the axes and the arrow, this is going to keep it lined up nicely. You could also go over here and turn on transparency, which might make it a little bit easier to line up because I can see that here's the top edge of the ring. I could move this until this green horizontal line right here is lined up with the top of the ring. Now I can use this inflate slider to make that thinner like that. And I could even stretch this a little bit vertically. If I wanted to, I can use the green box here just to stretch it, make it a little bit wider. And I might make it bigger. I want this to stick out a little bit more. So I'll use this yellow box in the middle to increase the size. And again, I still think it's a little thick, so I can deflate it just a bit and then increase the size again until I get it like I want it. I like that. Now we're going to use a drag copy. So the drag copy is in the move mode with the gizmo. If I hold down command or control and then click on this green arrow, I can move a copy down to the bottom. And again, I'm lining it up the same way. So I'm just looking for that, um, for this middle line to be lined up with the bottom of the ring. Notice when I do a drag copy that the original copy is dark and masked off. The copy we just dragged is not, so I could even rotate or do things to it. I'll just undo for right now. Now I need to clear this mask, so I'll hold down Command or Control, click and drag, and you can see now that I have both of the rings um, in position. But I want to do one last thing, which is going to line them up in such a way where they're centered in the universe. To do that, I need to make sure that symmetry is off, can go to the transform menu and make sure it's turned off. Then use this third icon up here above the gizmo. That finds the center of those two rings. And then when I click the home button, it's going to make an, a little tiny adjustment here that makes sure that these are lined up. Um, it's going to be center in the universe and then I'll go back to the ring and do the same thing. I can tell symmetry is on here, so let's use the shortcut, which is X. Let's use the third icon to find the middle. And I can tell that this is a little bit messed up. The uh, Gizmo 3D is not quite lined up. I'm going to hold down Option or Alt, which will unlock this lock, and then click this round arrow here, which will reset my orientation. 
I'll release the key and then now click on Home. And you can see it shifted it up just a little bit. So this top and bottom look even and they're centered on these other rings. Let's switch back to the other rings because I already see a problem with those as well. If I look carefully, I can see some faceting here. Hold down Option or Alt and then just click on those rings. So there's a shortcut. Instead of switching back and forth between active subtools, you can just hold down Option or Alt and click. If I zoom in on this, I can see that there's some faceting. So that faceting, I'm just going to switch back over to the draw mode and use that trick we learned before, which was to divide twice and then delete the lower subdivisions. So I'll use the shortcut Command D or Control D twice and then delete the lower subdivisions. If you have my hotkeys installed, which I would recommend, you'll just press the number three. If you don't have my hotkeys installed, you'll just go down to the geometry section and then look for the delete lower button. But there we have our rings. At this point, we could go ahead and take it over into Keyshot if we wanted. And I'll show you a little bit more about that here in a bit. Let me turn off transparency so I can see the ring. And in the next step, what we're going to do is create this as a bimetal ring. And it's just to show you how it's done. Um, to actually cast this as a bimetal would be a little bit more complicated because you'd have to create a slot for this other ring to sit in. And anyway, we won't go into the, the technical parts of it. But over here, I need to make sure that I have the material channel chosen up here at the top. What we're going to be doing is assigning a material to both parts of this. So we need to turn on the material channel, make sure that you're in the draw mode. If you're in the move mode, that channel is not available. So make sure you're in draw mode and choose material. Make sure that these outer rings are the ones that are chosen. And if you need to, hold down Option or Alt and click on those rings to make sure that they are the uh, correct subtool. Then go over to the material picker over here and let's make those upper rings gold. So I'll click on that and notice it turned the whole thing gold. Now we need to fill the object with that material. On the left hand side, if you have my interface, fill object is right down here. If you don't have my interface, it's up here under color down under this menu, fill object. Now what we need to do is select the middle. Hold down Option or Alt and click the mesh in the middle to make it active. Now go over to the material picker and choose one of the MA shinies, the MAH shiny. And then you still have one step left, which is to fill the object with that material. So now you can see that we have a bimetal ring. And that looks good. Let's take it one step further. In the subtool palette, I can see that I have both this cylinder, which is our mesh, and then the rings. I am going to merge these down into a single object. If I were 3D printing this, I would be 3D printing the entire thing. So it would need to be one ring. So I'll select this top one. I'll use merge down. It'll warn me and tell me it's not an undoable operation. I'll just click OK. And you can see now that it's still retained the materials, but it's all in one ring. At this point, I could save and I could also export. Let's go ahead and save while we're here. I'm not saving the entire project. Within ZBrush, if I save the project, I'm saving everything that's up here that I'm working on. I just want to save the Z tool, which is inclusive of any of these sub tools that you see over here. Under the tool palette, choose Save As. I'll go over here, I'm going to call it Mesh Band. Let me call this one Mesh Band 3. You'll see down here the format is a Z tool, not a Z project, which means it's just that one ring, and then click Save. If I wanted to export, I could go ahead and use the Export button here and export this as a .obj file. So I could call this meshband.obj. Or if you needed an STL file for some reason, you can go up here to Z plugin and go to the 3D print hub and choose export to STL. Mesh 
band.stl. And it will tell you that there's multiple, um, multiple subtools here. Uh, and we could say, let's say naming convention, we'll just use that one. And so then it exported all of the different parts. But that's all done. It's all good. Now we're ready to go into Keyshot. So you will have to have loaded Keyshot onto your computer. And there's two components of it. One is the Keyshot ZBrush bridge part. And once that's loaded, when you go up here into the render menu, you can choose external renderer and choose Keyshot. Once you've done that, then all you have to do is click the BPR button over here on the right. It will enable the Keyshot um, to ZBrush bridge. If you're on a Mac, it'll start bouncing over there, but you just need to switch to Keyshot and it's loaded the ring in. One thing you'll notice is that since we, since we loaded um, some colors on this ring in the other program in ZBrush, it has retained them, but they are not photorealistic. But it's a good thing because then you can see where we want to put the colors. In mine, I'm going to use something called Oxidized Silver, which is one I had added. Uh, you could choose any one of the silvers. Uh, actually, let's just do Silver Polished or Silver Rough. Click and drag that over here onto the ring. And then you can go find another, oh, I don't know, another uh, color, like I'm going to use Brass Polished, and drag that over onto the ring. And you'll get more of a photorealistic ring. If you don't see these, you can go over here to the materials section of the library, look for metal, or you can just search up here in the search box. You could uh, say search for silver. You could say silver brushed. I have another one here I like a lot, Oxidized Silver by Nacho Riesco. And then you can come up here and you could search gold. The gold that comes with Keyshot is 24 karat gold, so it's a very yellow gold. But you can see the difference here if I put it on there. It's very bright. Or you could use brass. The brass colors mimic uh, a little bit more like a 10 karat or 14 karat gold. So you can put that right there. And then if you have purchased the license for this, you can then click and render. If you're just in the demo mode, it'll show you this is demo, not for commercial, and it will put a watermark over it. But that's how you can actually create a ring in Keyshot. You'll also notice that mine is angled here. And if you wanted to adjust that, you can come up here to the Move tool. You'll select ZBrush, which will select everything, and click OK. And then it gives you this box down here, which allows you to rotate. There's a local axis or a global axis. Uh, if you are just trying to adjust it like this, I would choose local. And then you can use these axes right here to turn it as, as you want. I'm also in the tumble mode right here, which allows me to click and drag and rotate around. If you wanted to pan, you could switch to pan depending on your mouse, uh, that could be a little bit different too. There's also Dolly, which allows you to zoom in and out. And then I'm using a perspective of about 95. When all is said and done, you can also use Snap to Ground to make sure that it's down sitting on the ground, and then click the checkbox. If you have these orange lines, then you could just click somewhere on the background and they will go away. Render if you'd like, or just snap a screenshot for, uh, for testing, and there you have the mesh ring in ZBrush. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave the comments down below. Uh, again, I'd encourage you to download my interface. It's free, and I also have some instructions on how to install that and also the hotkeys. Uh, with that, I guess, uh, happy ZBrushing, and go forth and make great jewelry.